Welcome to the Unit 4 discussion on the era of Western dominance, specifically imperialism and colonialism in Africa and Asia. This really is the first of a two-part series because Unit 4 will talk about the wider scope of imperialism around the globe. And the second uh, uh, part of it next week will specifically look at China and Japan and how those two uh, go through the, the modes of imperialism and how those two come out uh, very differently from imperialistic influences. As always uh, with our lectures, this is the outline, so pay very close attention to it. And I would like you or encourage you to copy down the terms and to copy down and meditate on the big questions and consider those big questions as you go through the discussion boards uh, because I forget what I put down for the questions in the discussion board. But you are more than welcome to address those questions and incorporate the big questions, any of the big questions uh, that you see here in lecture. Uh, this is uh, actually the, the second time that I have re-recorded this, and I just want to make note of a few things. I make a f In the other videos, which I had already recorded, I made a few errors, and please note these are the errors that I made. Uh, it's rather self-explanatory. I also uh, had forgotten to add this video clip. I use quite a few movie clips for this particular lecture. I use, I think, about six of them. They're not particularly long. And this is one from a movie called Rabbit Proof Fence. It discusses uh, some eugenic poli eugenics policies that were enacted in Australia, I believe around 1910, 1900 to 1910. Uh, and I I, I don't. I, I didn't put it in last week because, although it would fit last week, it still kind of has more of an imperialist tinge to it. So I put it in this week. It really doesn't matter. But when you watch the slides in sequence, you'll understand why I put it in here the way I did. I don't mention this video in the in the video within the section that it's located. Just ignore that because I had forgot about it and then put it in after the fact. I didn't want to re-record the whole video. But this is a very good video. And you can see here I have this clip. Just kind of look at it, meditate on it, and maybe think about writing something about this in your discussion board also because uh, you, should, you should watch this clip and you should think about it uh, both in terms of what we've discussed in this lecture so far as you go through the sequence leading up to this video and also what you read last week in our unit on social Darwinism, the writings of Stoddard, Grant, and uh, Sanger. So meditate on that, look at the similarities and the differences, and see, uh, and, and tell me what you notice about them, the similarities, the differences, how this type of racial social Darwinism uh, is, uh, is um, fits into our discussion of imperialism and social Darwinism and, and ideas of superiority, but how it's different from some of the ones that we've discussed already. This is a somewhat larger lecture than usual. I have over 50 slides, and uh, some of the videos are rather long. Some of them are uh, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Uh, there's a few that are in the 30s. I do apologize for that, but next week the lecture will be a little bit shorter because we're only focusing on China and Japan. And while I can't guarantee it would be extremely short, it will certainly be a lot shorter than this week. So to begin with, I just want to remind you of the recap here we saw the over the past few weeks, the advent of an industrialized society, the creation of industrial capitalism, the uh, spread of industrial technology and the development of new technologies like the steam engine and the railroad and the, uh, the assembly line and interchangeable parts, precision machining, uh, modern developments. We have the rise of free market economics and modern capitalism, uh, which still exists today, although our society, like in the United States, is not quite as industrialized as it used to be, with a lot of that industrialism moving over to places like China and Japan. 
and Vietnam uh, and African nations, we still live in we still live within an economy that that comes out of this era of industrialism and capitalism. We see uh, increased national wealth or gross domestic product GDP, uh, not necessarily personal wealth. Remember what Henry George said with with this economic prosperity, with this progress, we also get loads and loads of poverty, but we do get significant increases in economic production and economic uh, profitability because of this new industrial capitalistic society. We have with the rise of free market economics comes private investment from members of the nobility and also just members of society that have money, uh, creating a middle class, an upper middle class, a well-off upper class, as well as your aristocrats that already existed, your peasants, and your working class as well. And because of that, we're going to have extreme class conflict and the fears of socialism and communism and uh, uh, struggles and rebellion against this oppressive laissez-faire capitalistic system and this monotonous and at times dangerous industrial uh, factory style society that's been created. And lastly, as we saw last week, we have the advent of new racial and radical sciences with regards to social structures and concepts of power dynamics and superiority. These social theories like uh, um, various social Darwinistic views uh, and eugenics, this desire to improve society, all of this comes out in this period. And now, what we saw then was more internal. We're going to turn our attention to the outside world, the world outside of Europe and the Western world, North America, uh, Western Europe. And we're going to see how these ideas of capitalism, industrialism, uh, ideas of superiority, uh, superior culture, and the need for profit are ex are are placed and exerted onto the world in places like Asia and Africa. And so that's what this lecture is going to be ultimately about, as well as the one next week. Now, lastly, before I turn the, uh, well, two things, before I turn the video over to the rest of the videos I already created, I want to point out uh, two things. First, because this lecture is so incredibly long, I am going to make the crash course videos for this week optional. Uh, they are in the, I removed them from the module uh, so they wouldn't overburden you. If you still want to watch them, I leave that entirely up to you. They can provide great context. But I realized I had made this lecture so long and so detailed and built it off of our previous two weeks that it really is not necessary to watch that those uh, videos. So if you want to watch those videos, that's up to you. Uh, but if you do not, it will not ruin this lecture in the slightest. The second is this clip I have from Mary Poppins. I have a lot of movie clips this week. I love using movie clips to bring the history back from the dead and try to uh, pull you in to the history, pull you in and, and, and get you as excited as I am to talk about this stuff and, and to also communicate the importance of it and how a lot of it still persists in our culture today, um, whether by uh, uh, design or uh, explicitly or implicitly. And one of them is this clip from Mary Poppins, and I don't mean this in a negative way about Mary Poppins. I imagine you, most of you have seen Mary Poppins. If you haven't, that is actually quite sad, and I do encourage you to see it. Mary Poppins is that wonderful 1964 movie by Walt Disney. It is a musical based on a series of books. Now, in this particular clip, it's the Tuppence song. And the reason why I like the Tuppence song is because it's so goofy and it has so much pomp and circumstance. But what I love about it is that when you watch it, watch this clip, listen to the lyrics, and think about what we talked about in the past two weeks and what we're going to talk about for the rest of this lecture. Maybe even go back and listen to it again after the lecture is over. I leave that up to you. But go and watch it and listen to all the words. This, is, this will be especially amusing if you already have seen the movie and are aware of this song. Because you'll hear them talk about these ideas of affluence, money, capital, 
power, prestige. And they'll talk about building dams and railroads in places all around the globe. And you should know that Mary Poppins takes place in 1910 in Great Britain, which is really at the height of the period that we're talking about here, which is from uh, in this lecture, which is about 1880 to 1914. So uh, the last 20 years of the, tw of the 19th century and uh, the first 14 years of the 20th century really ending on the eve of World War I. So what we see here is that kind of peak of great European imperialism. I, I don't want to call it a, a golden age because, I mean, it that just sounds absolutely Eurocentric and, and chauvinist. But uh, this peak of power of European colonialism and imperialism. And a lot of that was very cleverly woven into this song that was written for this movie. I also want to add that and this would really, this is really for the people who've seen this movie, that the character, uh, the, the family of the, the Banks, the Banks family, uh, George Banks being this gentleman right here, and his children whom uh, Mary Poppins comes to watch and be their nanny, uh, they are a member of the of the upper middle class. Uh, they are doing very, very well. But if you recall, George Banks, who works for a bank, uh, he's a financier, he is looking to move himself up in the world. He wants to find greater security for himself and greater security and prosperity for his family. And he's trying to go from being in the middle class and upper middle class you know, doing very well. He's a professional person, works for a bank, but he's trying to make that jump into the upper class. Uh, and the men that he's with here at this bank, these older men here that run and direct the bank, uh, and in this case, I believe uh, uh, this gentleman even owns the bank, uh, they, are, uh, they are part of this upper class. And so he works for them and they're very close. They're very close in rank, but they are still higher rank than he is in society. So he is trying to jump that social ladder. So when you hear them sing about this stuff about class and affluence and investment and kind of creating wealth and, and expanding one's ability to influence, all of this really is, is uh, a great encapsulation of what we talked about for, um, uh, the past two weeks, especially the first week when it comes to industrializing and, and these uh, and this kind of upper class bourgeois mobility uh, that, that Marx would have been absolutely infuriated at. It also kind of fits into our social Darwinistic discussion last week, and we're going to get a heavy dose of that again this week. Because while the Banks family is not... not um, depicted as being racist or anything like that, uh, you still get the idea of a class structure, a, a structure of that's based around investment, prosperity, affluence, survival of the fittest. And you can kind of get a sense when you listen to uh, the lyrics uh, of that there is an imperialistic bent here too. So I will leave you with that. Uh, go and enjoy these lecture videos. Enjoy all of the movie clips I have amassed for this. I, I know it will be long, but I really hope that you'll find this engaging and exciting. And certainly will um, uh, uh, there'll be things in this that will be very important for you and that things that you'll gravitate towards. And uh, definitely li listen to uh, or watch this clip uh, either either at the very beginning or watch it at the very end or maybe both. And I'm sure you'll get a, get a bit of a kick out of it too. And with that, I will leave you for the rest of the lecture. Uh, good luck and uh, enjoy.